Hello and welcome to GameSack. In this episode, I'm going to take a look at some games that are, for all intents and purposes, practically broken. I mean, these games were in no way, shape, or form ready to be released in their current condition. And with that said, let's just get one of the big ones right out of the way. Yes, it's Superman for the Nintendo 64 from Titus. Did you just say tits? This one was sent to us maybe five or six years ago by Warp Zone Games, and I never even bothered turning it on until now. I really don't want to play this. But here goes nothing. Oh, it looks like Superman's friends have been willingly captured by Lex Luthor and I need to rescue them from a virtual world. Then there's no time to waste. Okay, right off the bat, I have absolutely no idea how to control Superman. I struggle for a bit, but eventually I figure out the controls well enough to fly through these rings. And why am I flying through rings? Is this a bonus stage already? Because this is definitely something that you would do in a bonus stage. I've got to say, it's pretty tough at first. I keep missing a ring and then I go back and try and get it and I eventually run out of time. Why is Lex Luthor timing me and why do I just give up when the timer runs out? Anyway, like I said, it can be tough at first because the game is actually trying to run as fast as it can, meaning that it will speed up and slow down depending on how much is on screen and that can really throw you off. You do get used to it though and actually start to become quite adept at flying through all of these dumb rings. Also, it turns out that you can miss three or four of them and still make it to the end so no need to turn around like I was doing. So you make it to the end and then you're given some quick instructions and wait, I did not have time to read that! So I fumble around with the controls again while the new timer runs out. And then it puts me all the way back at the start of the rings. It turns out that I'm trying to prevent the only two cars in the city from running over the only two pedestrians in the city. I just have to pick them up and move them away. And initially that was kind of hard for me to do because I was still figuring out the controls. Anyway, once you do that, all right, more rings. Lex says that you're solving his maze by flying through these things in the allotted time period. Uh, Lex, I've got news for you. This isn't a maze. It's just a bunch of rings. You are truly an idiot. Next, I need to carry a police car down the street before the thugs blow it up with bazookas. And after that, more rings. Then you're fighting these shadow guys, which all die with one hit with some of the worst fighting controls I've ever experienced. Come on, Superman, just hit him. It's not that hard. And then, you guessed it, more rings to fly through. I don't understand why a character that's practically invincible like Superman is beholden to rings that he has to fly through. Oh, and this one is fun. You have to defeat the three scary dust devils with your super breath. The game actually calls them tornadoes though. But you just can't fly up to them and breathe, oh no. First, you need to collect this damn icon otherwise your breath won't work. And this icon can be a bitch to grab if you happen to miss it as you're flying towards the twisters. This section doesn't have a timer at all, but sometimes you still lose for no reason. And of course, if you lose, back to flying through the rings. Well, actually, not always. Sometimes it will start you out after the rings and I can't find any rhyme or reason for it. Anyway, defeat the dust devils and fly through more rings. The developers really like this ring stuff. And I mean, they really, really like it. And they're really hoping that you like it as much as they do. Make it to the end in time and you win! Woohoo! Now you're finally done with stage one! In stage two, it looks like things are about to get a little bit interesting. Well, they would be interesting if the control wasn't as awful as it is. You run around, finding cards to open doors remotely like you do in a lot of different action-adventure games. You actually have things you need to do in a certain order. But the presentation and the gameplay is just so bad that it doesn't work at all. Often, Superman won't walk in the direction that you press if the camera is not directly behind him. Pressing the Z button switches between flight and ground modes and that can get you mixed up as well. For example, sometimes I press Z to fly but I just float there. I can't do anything but just drop back down and try again. The variable frame rate doesn't help here either. In fact, I'm amazed that Titus was able to make this game as bad as it is. It's super letterboxed, so the game doesn't take up much screen real estate at all. I've zoomed it in for this review, but on a normal TV, it would look like this. The logic behind this is that the less you draw on the screen, the faster the processors can update everything. That's why a lot of Super Nintendo games are letterboxed. And despite having less stuff on screen as a result, this game is plagued with slowdown and a draw distance of about maybe 25 feet. There's lots of glitchy stuff that can get you stuck and you'll be lucky if you can wiggle your way out. Possibly the best part about the game is that it has a few voice clips from the animated Superman cartoon that was on at the time. Then there's no time to waste. This whole game is a waste of time. Every other stage is a fly through a ton of rings a bunch of times snore fest. 
and the action-adventure stages really aren't much more exciting either. According to an interview with John Wheeler, developer Eric, um, Kahn? I don't know how to pronounce that, it's French. Anyway, he blamed Warner Brothers and DC for limiting what they could do and insisting that it take place in a virtual world. He also said that less than 10% of what they wanted made it into the game, and he also blamed the Nintendo 64 for not being able to deliver what they wanted. Okay, I can understand the restrictions on the character's powers in the virtual world and the such, but that does not mess up the game's control and design, nor does the Nintendo 64 being what it is. So I'm gonna say that's somewhat of a cop-out. The game feels to me like the team who made it didn't share a singular vision, and the ring levels were filler to pad the game's length since it fell short otherwise. It's a very bad and very unfinished and unpolished product, and my life is now worse having had played it. This is Slaughter Sport on the Genesis from Razorsoft. This was an attempt at a one-on-one -on -one fighting game long before they refined the genre into what we know it as today. This game was originally released as Tongue of the Fat Man on PC, but it's also known as Mondu's Fight Palace on other platforms. When the Genesis was announced, this was one of the first third-party games that was supposed to come out along with a football game called Hard Yardage. Unfortunately, Activision was falling on some pretty hard times back then. Their hard yardage game was to be repurposed into the first Joe Montana football game, but they were in no condition to deliver. So Sega got Park Place Productions to make their football game for them, and Mondu's Fight Palace was neglected. As time went on, edgy publisher Razorsoft picked up the license, changed the name to Slaughter Sport, and called it a day. And if you ever get the chance, please don't play this. The first thing you notice is that you get stuck playing as the weakling human fighting against a blue version of yourself. The next thing that you notice is that none of your button presses seem to register. You have to hold the buttons down for half a second it seems before you actually attack. And even then it's not like you stand a chance of your attack doing much damage as the enemy just darts all around you delivering the punishment. You have two attacks as well as a special item, all mapped to their very own buttons. The special attack causes status effects to your opponent, like a spike shield above their head so that they can't jump. You can actually select other characters in the game, but you have to enter codes with the controller in the title screen to do it. And you'll definitely need to do this if you want to have any chance of beating this first round. If you win, you get taken to the shop where you can buy more special items and it tells you what each of them do. You can also buy more health and attack power. That's right, your health isn't refilled between rounds. You have to buy it back. And you can only lose three times before it's game over for you. Oh, and I almost forgot! When you get knocked down, you get back up facing away from your opponent. You have to turn around before you can attack, which isn't quick or easy. And by this time, your opponent has already delivered two or three attacks. It's infuriating! Some characters do have backward attacks like this farting demon guy. What does this game think it is? Primal Rage? God, how I wish it were. One nice thing I can say, though, is that the scrolling is pretty good for its time. But this game is relentless and the controls are so broken that you do not stand a chance. It's absolutely no wonder that Activision abandoned this and not at all surprising that Razorsoft picked it up as their standards have never been that high. Okay, I know at least one of you out there has wanted me to play Superman on the Nintendo 64 forever, like six, seven years now. You know who you are. I hope you can die happy now, because I can't. Oh, jeez. Anyway, let's take a look at two more of these pieces of shit. This is Crime Wave, an exclusive game on the Saturn from Eidos. There's a rash of crime on the streets, and of course you, as a bounty hunter, need to stop it. The game's played in your car with a rotating isometric view. This does no favors for the gameplay, which I'll touch on in just a bit. You start out just driving around while the game figures out a target car for you. Once that finally happens, you follow the red arrow to wherever it points you. But getting there is not as easy as it seems thanks to the aforementioned isometric view. 
It's often very difficult to see paths that you can take and areas where you can't go, but you think you can. There are barriers everywhere. And you don't rotate the camera yourself. The screen rotates automatically depending on the direction your car is pointed. And it always feels like the road and the camera are somehow fighting you. It's all very disorienting, as I'm sure you can tell just by watching this. It doesn't help that you can't see very much around your car at all. You can press the C button to zoom out a bit, but not by much. There is a mini-map on the upper right to help you out a tiny bit though. The problem is, is that you can only use it as a quick guide to glance at because you need to keep your eyes on the main screen to maneuver around the obstacles. And let's not forget that the frame rate is barely even in the double digits most of the time. Once you make it to the target car, your task, of course, is to destroy them. This is easier said than done because in order to shoot them, you need to be pointing at them. And that is damn hard to do a lot of the time since everything is always moving around. You can fire backwards, but it's not often that you'll have the proper weapons in stock to do that. If you manage to destroy the target car, pick up all the junk that they drop, which is usually extra weapons and stuff, and wait for the game to pick a new target for you. Then you go and do it all again. If your target escapes, you'll have to wait for the game to assign another one for you. And that's the thing, the target is always escaping or the timer runs out before you get to them, mainly because driving around in this world is so disorienting. And the game sometimes takes its own sweet time locating another target for you, and when it does, of course, it's never close by. There are also a lot of innocent cars driving around that get in your way, and if they get damaged, you get fined, and when that happens, you'll just need to destroy even more enemies to advance. That's right, you get 100 mechs each time you destroy a target. And once you have enough mechs, you can finally go through the gate into the next area. If what I've said about this game already doesn't sound bad enough, well, the game hesitates and pauses a lot. Just look at this. Just try maintaining control when this keeps happening. And it happens quite a bit, nearly making the game unplayable at times. Sometimes I feel like the game is just gonna lock up. You've also got to worry about rivals driving around trying to kill you. And these guys are also going after the same targets that you are. And there's even random turrets on the ground that shoot at you. There's lots of different areas in the game and different types of vehicles to drive, but the thing is that it's just never fun because the game feels like my Saturn's about to cough out its CPU and it's just not designed well at all. There's even some fun little bugs like here where you drive under the overpass and you can just get on top of the bridge just magically. This bug is repeatable, and honestly, I'm not that surprised that they didn't catch it. It's like they got so far making the game and realized that it's barely playable that they just might as well stop and just release it now. Overall, I feel that this game did have potential, but the technical as well as the design flaws just really do bring it down. I sure can't leave out Rise of the Robots from Absolute Entertainment, shown here on the 3DO. The developers actually thought that they would have a leg up on Street Fighter 2 with this one. Seriously, they did. But judging from the final result here, they've likely never played or even seen Street Fighter 2, or any other video game for that matter. You play as a six foot tall naked robot thingy named Cyborg. That's right, he's the only character that you can choose, at least in the single player game. Yeah, that's what was wrong with Street Fighter 2, being able to choose your character, or even having interest in characters. Nobody wants that. Basically, it's a Terminator-like storyline where the computer became smart and wants to eliminate humans, so it's taken over a bunch of machines that you have to fight in one-on-one -on -one battles to save humanity, blah blah blah. The developer said that this one would have amazing AI to learn the player's patterns and make the game more fun and more challenging. Hmm, sounds interesting. Everything here is pre-rendered and the sprites animate smoothly, however, the backgrounds don't scroll at all. You seem to have only one attack no matter which button you press on the controller, and that's a punch which turns into a kick if you press it mid-jump. If you hold down the L or R shoulder button, that attack turns into a kick. And that's another thing that people hated about other fighting games. Too many attacks and good control. Don't want any of that. Honestly, I don't think it has a chance to dethrone Street Fighter 2, but maybe that's just me. The fighting action is completely broken. There's next to no strategy and you'll only get frustrated trying to do the things that you can't do. In fact, I was lucky if my attacks even landed. But who needs collision detection? According to the developers, you only need it randomly sometimes. But of course, the enemy can hit you without any issue. 
The visuals are extremely dreary and lack variety. You mainly find yourself fighting in the most boring warehouses ever imagined. It's as if the art director had a rule where everything had to look as boring and as lifeless as possible. And the sound isn't any better. All you hear in most stages is ambient room tone and the timer counting down. Or this stage where it sounds like someone breathing. It's like they literally wanted to put the player to sleep. There is music, but only during the FMV sequences. And there are a lot of these sequences showing you running to the next area, the opponent wandering in, and other mundane stuff like that. If that's not bad enough, after you defeat the first three opponents, you need to fight them again because there aren't enough unique characters in the game. The final boss is obviously inspired by the T-1000 from Terminator 2. This is actually kind of cool, for about seven seconds, because her attacks are unavoidable and she actually even refills her own life gauge. The best part is that you only have two continues for the entire game. And after the game over screen, the credits roll, which you can't skip at all. Then you get the Rise of the Robot screen and some music plays, literally forever. This is it, you can't exit this screen. Even if you press everything, it will stay here. The only way to try again is to literally power the console off and then back on, which reboots the game. But honestly, I think the developers knew that you'd only ever play this once, so they didn't bother having the game return to the main menu. The 3DO was only one of the platforms it got ported to though. It also came to the 16-bit consoles like the Super Nintendo here. This version is actually better than the 3DO port because of two things. Firstly, it has music during the matches. It's not bad at all, but it's not mind-blowing or anything, and it doesn't need to be. I'm just glad it's there. It at least helps the game feel a bit less boring. And the screen now scrolls left and right as you move, and it even has some line-scrolling floors. There are even super moves that you can enable, but I'll be damned if I can figure out how to use them. You now have dedicated buttons for punching and kicking, but the controls and gameplay are still a mess. Actually, this one is a lot tougher. I can't get anywhere in the game since it doesn't have any continues. But then I heard that if you just walk towards an enemy and attack when you're in range, you'll almost always get a hit. And yep, I restarted the game from the beginning doing this and I never even lost a single match. Yeah, I took some damage here and there, but I was always able to nab the victory. So much for that great AI that it was supposed to have. And when you beat the game, they still figure you'll never want to play it again as it's impossible to get back to the title screen without resetting the console. Seriously, that's just so odd. Anyway, I was eager to see if I could do the same thing on the 3DO version, so I booted it back up and no, you can't. And can you believe they actually went and made a sequel to this called Rise 2 Resurrection? Or Resurrection Rise 2, I don't know. It's a phenomenal game in comparison. Look, you have a character select screen with tons of fighters to choose from. You have a full six button control scheme that's actually somewhat responsive. You even have special moves. Granted, it only seems awesome compared to the original game. It's still a crappy fighter though. It came to the PC, Saturn, and PlayStation, and I'm playing the Saturn version here just because. Gameplay wise, it's really not so hot. The moves are all kind of janky and the animation seems lacking. The backgrounds are still mostly empty, boring, and uninspired. Plus, all of the music and sound is in mono, at least it is on the Saturn version. But still, the music is somewhat decent. If this is how good the first game had been, then maybe there would have been hope for the series. But Rise of the Robots is a game that won't be forgotten for all the wrong reasons. Rise of the Robot sure feels right at home on the 3DO, doesn't it? Man, some of these games are starting to cause me physical pain having to play these. And since it's a Game Sack episode, I know you're in pain having to watch this. But we're not done. Yeah, I'm talking about another video pinball game, sorry. I promise I'll try to be quick about this one. Anyway, this is Pinball Graffiti on the Saturn, which was only released in Japan and Europe. 
It looks like there's some sort of weird story mode and I can't figure it out since I have the Japanese version, but that's not why we're here today. You can choose from a few different tables and, well, that's cool. Every table is rendered entirely with polygons, which is actually kind of unique for a video pinball game from this time. And the boards themselves are decent if unexciting. But again, that's not why we're here today. Oh no, we're here for the ball cam. That's right, you can play the entire game following the pinball around. You can have it face in the direction that the ball's rolling and that makes knowing which button to press for the flippers confusing at times. But it gets worse, much worse. That's right, there's even a first person view where you are the ball. Hell, I found it nearly impossible to even get out of the launch chute, much less navigate my way around the board. Of course, this mode is super slow compared to real pinball and you can't really play a serious game here. You'd think that the overhead mode would be easier, but not really. Okay, okay, this game really isn't broken per se, but I just really wanted to mention how crazy this mode is. I mean, the ball cam is basically unplayable. Anyway, let's move on to something that is actually broken. This is Ride to Hell Retribution on the PlayStation 3 from Deep Silver. I don't know what this 1% in the title is about, but I'm just going to assume it's how finished they were with making this game. This turd was also released on the Xbox 360 and the PC in 2013, but it was originally announced in 2008 and subsequently cancelled. Or at least that's what everyone thought. They were actually still working on it and it was re-announced in 2013 as three games, with this one being the main entry. The others were smaller downloadable games, but they were never released because this one tanked so badly. Yes, this game was in development for five years, so just keep that in mind as you watch this review. In the game you control Jake Conway, who just came back from Vietnam and is trying to fit into his world only to find that it's all messed up. Well, ain't that the truth, this game is a mess. The first thing you'll notice is just how awful and low budget everything looks. It's choppy, uses very few polygons, and the textures are just bad. Most PlayStation 2 games have better graphics than what's seen here. They can be glitchy and the textures load in whenever the hell they damn well feel like it just to make things worse. Also, the game's story barely makes any sense. So you and your younger brother are hanging out when an evil biker gang approaches and starts asking you guys questions about the jacket that your younger brother is wearing. And it turns out that your dad is someone that this biker gang does not like. And by extension, they don't like you. So they kill your little brother right in front of you as they want all of your dad's lineage gone forever. Then they start shooting and the screen fades out. Suddenly it's a different day and you're fine. I guess maybe you took a single bullet, but did they just let you go? I'm not sure, it's not really explained. Anyway, the game is a mission to hunt down the biker gang and make them all pay for your brother's death. The game is divided up into five different styles of gameplay. The first style consists of the motorcycle stages. All right, finally Road Rash gets an upgrade. And yeah, I'm gonna have to take that back because this is far, far worse than Road Rash. Basically, you ride down the road with wonky and floaty physics. The best way to describe it is that it feels like your controller is three or four times the size that it actually is. Strange, I know, but that's what it feels like. This is pretty boring, so they added a few things like little ramps that you can jump off so that you know you're having fun. Or maybe even cement pipes to ride through. Or trucks to slide under. But be careful, because even if you successfully power slide underneath something, the game might decide that you didn't and reset you. Over and over and over. I'm thinking this part here might be missing a line of code, or 26. You can even power slide off of a jump. This game doesn't care. Physics be damned. Sometimes you'll get into battles which are basically just quick time events. Just press a button a few times and you win the fight. Honestly, it's pretty much impossible to lose unless you just decide not to press the button out of sheer apathy. The second type of gameplay is the sandbox style where you can roam around. Well, actually you don't have as much freedom here as you think you do as the areas that you wander aren't very big. You eventually get to your hometown which acts as a hub world. Here you can sell drugs and buy new guns and ammo. You can also unlock better motorcycles and upgrade your current ones. But other than that, there's not much going on here as you spend most of your time riding from place to place. The third style of gameplay is a beat-em-up which will make you appreciate even the worst 3D fighting games. You can punch, kick, swing a weapon, or block. 
The enemy loves blocking you and if you press the square button you can usually break through it. Sometimes you'll enter a rage mode where you engage in some awesome quick time events that are piss easy. Some fights, like the so-called boxing matches, will end with a quick time event as well which you just can't lose. Pretty basic stuff and not at all exciting. The fourth style is the third person cover shooter. It works like any other cover shooter except that the aiming controls are pretty fidgety and these stages can be very long and drawn out. Also, a lot of the enemies are complete bullet sponges unless you shoot them directly in the head. Actually, I take that back as some enemies can literally take unlimited shots from a shotgun to their heads. The enemies run all over the place in this mode and they barely even react to your presence. Nor do they care if there's an obstacle between them and you, they'll just keep shooting at the obstacle. Like here, where I run past all of these red flammable canisters which of course explode if they get shot. The enemies keep shooting at me and of course the barrels blow up and then they all die. There aren't too many games out there with AI as brain dead as this. The last style of gameplay is the loading screen. You'll be enjoying this far more than anything else in the game. It's here often and it's here long. You'll enjoy it for 20 seconds before a 10 second cutscene, then again for another 20 seconds followed by another cutscene, and then again before the actual gameplay finally loads. Sometimes they even mix up the styles of gameplay like having you shoot your gun while you're on your motorcycle. This can be pretty odd and at least the game slows down but the aiming becomes even more difficult. But don't worry, you're still gonna win and at least you don't run out of ammo in these segments. The game tries to be edgy. It's attempting to be as violent as it can be. There's lots of blood everywhere, even though it just looks kind of sad. And of course, Jake has sex with each and every female character he meets, all while fully clothed, as you do. You even have a radio buddy. RVDE Roamer, come in. Come in, RVDE Roamer. A lot of the music is actually pretty good, but I feel bad for it for having to exist in this game. Sadly, it's a chore to play, and not because it's challenging, it's definitely not challenging, but because it's boring and the AI issues certainly don't help. Now it's my turn. Well, thank God that's over. Well, actually, I have to admit, I did have a little fun seeing how far I could get in Superman and Ride to Hell Redemption just to see how much more messed up they could be. So there was a little bit of entertainment value in there for me anyways. Uh, my least favorite games were Slaughter Sport and the 3DO version of Rise of the Robots. There's nothing redeemable about those. It's just not fun to play even because they're so bad. It's just stay far, far away. Anyway, what are some games that you think are broken? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching Game Set. I never have to play this piece of crap again. Holy crap, I can't believe how many green dogs I scored! <laughs>